very warm welcome everybody to our first formal AGM as a professional society. We've had meetings in the past which we've called AGMs as the informal association, but this is the first time it's really been a, a proper AGM according to the rules of charity. So thank you very much for coming along and taking part. The next slide, please. So the purpose of the AGM is twofold, really. It's for the trustees to give you, the members, an update on what we've been doing this year to develop the society in, in pursuit of our aims. And it's also for members to have an opportunity to ask us questions and also raise topics and ideas for future consideration. So often in an AGM, there would be voting and resolutions to be voted upon. Um, the main vote and decision that needs to be taken at the moment is to elect new trustees for the society. Um, but because we do that by electronic voting, it's not actually happening during the AGM, we will launch the elections and then the voting will happen in three weeks following the, the AGM. Um, and there will be discussion later about other ways that society members can get involved and put their ideas forward. Uh, so whilst we don't have any, any resolutions to be voted on today, there's lots of opportunities to help shape the society. Uh, we don't have any previous minutes to be approved as, as the formalities require, because this is the first time it's been a formal AGM. Um, we have apologies from a couple of the trustees, Claire Wyatt and, and Moj Gangabiri, who can't be here today, um, but I think the other trustees are present and everybody's available generally via Slack as well. Next slide, please. So today we've split the AGM into two parts. So part one starting now is the, the kind of formal AGM with the trustees reports and then an opportunity to ask questions and have some discussion after that. And then part two is primarily the launch of the trustee elections. So we've got the candidates standing for election. Many of them are present and are going to give lightning talk pitches. Uh, to help you inform your votes in that election and there'll also be some information there about how to get involved in society activities in the coming year. So because of the webinar format we're going to do the questions via this Slido application that's been used before for our conferences and on webinars and things very successfully. So I'd like to ask you to please use that link below to ask questions via Slido. You can put them in at any time during the presentations or afterwards in the discussion session. Um, and the link to that Slido has been put in the chat, the Zoom chat, for easier clicking. Um, so please don't ask your questions in the chat window itself, but, but do them on Slido. The advantage of that is it also lets you um, upvote questions that you would like an answer to and add comments and things, I think. So um, that, that should work well. Uh, so as someone who's just joined can't see the link, so I think the plan is to repost the link once or twice because you can't see the chat before you join. Um, next slide, please. We'll have a short break between those two parts as well, 10 minutes to, to nip out in between. So a lot of the content of our trustees presentations today is drawn from our first um, formal trustees annual report that's just been put together. Um, so I'd really like to thank all the trustees and, and particularly Paul Richmond for putting together this annual report and uh, I think it, it's a really good summary of where we are now as a society and what we've done since our foundation in March 2019. So um, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, we're going to draw out a lot of the highlights in these presentations but that's there for future reference and pointing out to people who want to know what it's all about. Next slide please. So this first section is going to be um, me providing a sort of overview of some of the highlights as the president of the society. Next slide, please. So these are the trustees of the society over, over the last year, since the elections that we held following last year's conference. So of these trustees, um, the six people on the left of this slide are people who were founding trustees of the society from the year before in some cases longer than that and um, those people are finishing their two-year term 
I mean, we've moved to two year terms, but for the first year, we had a one year term for the people who'd previously been trustees so that we could establish this staggered system of electing six of the 12 trustee places every year. So Tanya, me, Michaela, Simon, Andy and Claire are finishing their terms this year. And Anya, James, Mojgan, Joe, Paul and Matt um, were elected for the first time last year and will be continuing without re-election this year. So we've um, worked hard this year to sort of try to ensure a smooth handover, having just got things established. Um, we, for the first time this year, we had a vice president and vice treasurer roles. So Paul um, was elected vice president by the trustees and Matt vice treasurer. And so really as of now, sort of these trustees finishing their term are, are standing down as trustees. And so really this marks the transition where I'm handing over the president role to Paul and Simon will be handing over the treasurer role to Matt. Um, so congratulations, Paul and Matt <laughs> and, and the other continuing trustees. Um, a little bit more about the roles in a second. Next slide, please. So I'm just sort of to put in context where we are now in our history. This is a slide many of you will have seen versions of before. Um, but really, we've come a very long way in these sort of seven or eight years since the RSE term first got coined and the UK RSE Association started as a grassroots movement. Um, it's been such a rapid development of the community. And really, the last few years have been dominated by this process of formalising this informal association into a, a sort of real organisation, which has its own funds and can make its own decisions and doesn't depend on any relationship with any other institution for its existence. And I think we've got to the point now where this, this transition has successfully happened. We're set up as a society with paying members with our own bank accounts and processes and things. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But really this year has marked the transition between our initial setup, getting things off the ground and getting ourselves in a position where we can take forward sort of more exciting new initiatives and do new things for the community as a formal society. So I think that's where we are overall going into this next year. Next slide, please. So, Especially the early, I mean, our, our trustees annual report this time, as it's the first one, covers actually uh, a longer period from our foundation in March 2019 up until the end of June 2020. And really the early part of that period, or really the first two thirds of it, I'd say, were really dominated by setting up this new organisation, getting things off the ground. And as part of that, we had our, our first formal elections as an organisation last year. And the early months, once the new trustees were elected, um, we were putting in place a lot of things about how the trustee board operates. And for the first time, establishing sort of formal roles for trustees, rather than people had always sort of taken the lead on different things, but we tried to define a set of roles that the society needed going forwards. So the roles that we defined, we've got this system of having a president and vice president and a treasurer and vice treasurer. And the idea is that if possible, the the vice president and treasurer roles would be somebody in the first year of their election um, as a trustee so that they're not leaving at the end of that year and then we can have them take over those roles to ensure some continuity year to year because this is quite a, a large turnover of trustees which has really good points like you get a bit more energy and vibrancy and bringing in of new ideas every year but you've also got to work quite hard to ensure continuity and not losing of sort of knowledge and information year to year. So that was our attempt to address that. And then we've got some other roles as you might expect, like the secretary who you know, helps the meetings run smoothly and um, publish summary minutes and so forth. Um, well, if there's someone not muted with the dog, <laughs> could you perhaps mute, thank you. Um, secretary the membership lead because there's a lot of work involved in smoothly operating um, communication with our members and ensuring people's um, queries are met and are 
a huge amount of work involved in uh, administering our membership portal as well as some of you might have encountered some of the, the issues we've had there working with our provider. Um, Claire Wyatt as our communications lead has really put in place loads of great stuff this year to do with communications. Um, a little bit more about that later, but having a real communications plan and a, a sort of proactive approach to keeping in touch. It's been fantastic. A diversity and inclusion lead, um, and there's so many different aspects to this, as well as sort of all the aspects of diversity we're familiar with in all areas. There's lots of issues to do with bringing in new, reaching new parts of the RSE community that might not already be fully engaged or places where they might not even know about the term RSE as much. And then we've got a lot of great work going on on the um, on our website and our online services and also a lot of work to set those things up, which we'll hear more about later. And as well as that, other trustees, rather than having a sort of standing named role, have been more inclined to sort of take the lead on specific initiatives and things like that. So there'll be a bit more about some things in the pipeline later. And as well as having the vice president and vice treasurer, we've tried to ensure sort of redundancy for the other roles by having like a second person named to work with the lead person in each case. There's been a lot to do to set up how the board operates this year. I'm not going to go into the, the boring details that uh, even we would not like to talk about anymore. But um, broadly, how we operate is defined at a very high level by our constitution and by some of the rules of the Charity Commission and things like that. But that's only at a very high level and it doesn't really define a lot about how we operate. So there's been a great deal of putting in place and documenting processes for how we operate. Um, there's some operations manual and development of induction materials for trustees been going on, still a work in progress to be carried on next year. And lots to um, help, help the board operate effectively and, and work together. I mean, we were sort of a fully online organisation almost before COVID-19 meant that everybody was. Um, we typically have monthly online meetings and sort of quarterly face-to-face -face meetings. So obviously those haven't been happening in the second half of the year. So we've got a lot of good processes for working together online, including making decisions between meetings via Slack and publishing of minutes and decision logs so people, members can see what we're doing and managing what we're doing via GitHub issues. Next slide, please. So, you know, the, the broader RSE context, the, the progress continues to be extremely rapid with this really, really fast growth of RSE groups in the UK, which has been a really major success of the RSE movement in the last few years. Um, 28 groups as of the last count earlier this year, I think. Um, and usually every time we present this slide, there's a few that we haven't got on the picture that, that want to be added afterwards. So uh, no signs of that slowing down. And when we asked how fast these groups were growing, we found there was a, about a 30% annual growth rate across the board, which is pretty phenomenal. So it's grown fast and there's no, no sign of that slowing down. And one of the things the society does is to support this RSE leaders network where there's some peer support for people who are setting up or running groups or who would like to set up a group in their university. Um, and that, that's been really important. Next slide, please. So the conference and um, today on my um, on my phone a notification popped up this morning saying this day last year and showing me the photo of last year's conference and it made me feel a bit sad about the the fact that we're doing this AGM on a, a Zoom call rather than in a, a great buzzing room full of you know the whole community around us but uh, this is where we are and we're also so fortunate that we have this sort of very vibrant online community so things didn't stop flat when we weren't able to run the conference this year but you know these numbers show how how that conference series has been just growing and growing going from strength to strength i've no doubt this year's conference would have continued that trend but as it stands we're just going to be super well prepared for the next conference that we're able to run next slide please so yes, last year's conference, 360 attendees, 123 speakers, which I think is absolutely amazing when you think about it, like that proportion of the community to be standing up and contributing and sharing their knowledge, it's just fantastic. 
um, you know, major thanks to, to Claire and Andy, Andrew, who um, were the co-chairs of last year's conference. It was a phenomenal success. And to all the committee members and volunteers who made it happen. Um, there was loads of good feedback, but 98% of people who would attend again, I think really speaks for itself. As well, there was a lot of constructive feedback and you know, suggestions for things to be improved for the future. And um, Claire produced a really detailed feedback report that's available to next year's committee. So all of that will be taken on board. And a lot of work had already gone into planning for the 2020 conference. And when we had to cancel it, um, obviously that was a major blow, but a lot of the work will still be valid and will still be useful for future years. Um, and it's worth pointing out that luckily and thanks to the hard work of trustees and things we were able to cancel the conference without any financial loss to the society so we were able to take that decision at the right time before we'd paid any deposits or committed to anything so whilst we we're all really disappointed it doesn't damage the society and um, the good work such as a lot of great research onto possible new venues and a really fantastic conference committee being in place who had already had lots of good ideas I think that will give us a really great head start for the next conference and also a load of work was done formalizing how that um, volunteer committee relates to the society trustees because it becomes a little bit more formal now that we're um, handling our own money and we have to sort of delegate responsibility for spending money to this conference committee so there's been loads of good work and we're going to be much better prepared going into that, having a lot of things written down about how that works. So that's, that's going to be good. Um, next slide, please. As well as the community really taking off in the UK and that growth continuing, um, the international growth has continued as well. Um, this is the international RSC associations that we're aware of at the moment. Um, the most recent one to be added was Belgium this year. Um, and so we're really happy to work with the international RSE community and to um, encourage and support people who are trying to set up similar associations in other countries in whatever way we can. Next slide, please. And one particular thing that's just about to happen this month um, is the second international RSE leaders workshop. And um, there's a link there. And this is really bringing together people who are either running or hoping to set up sort of communities in, for their country or maybe for some particular domain or other subdivision of the RSE community, bringing these people together and focusing on helping each other with the practical steps to build communities and drive progress and also some practical working sessions to help set up solutions to strengthen how we work together internationally between the international associations and possibly even moving towards formalising that in some ways and having better communication between ourselves that's fantastic so um, some of the trustees have been involved in helping to organize that along with the international organizing committee a couple of other international initiatives that trustees have got involved in you'll hear a bit more later about the source events um, the sort of response to the cancellation of all the RSE conferences that's been a, a fantastic success of international collaboration and the RSE stories podcast so trustees have been helping um, find good people to take part in podcasts and collaborating with the international people who've been organising those. Next slide, please. So membership was launched um, just before the last conference. And in our annual report, we've documented there were 292 members at the end of the reporting period on the 30th of June. And the growth has continued since then. So we're now up to 322 members. We haven't regenerated this graph but uh, you can see that that uptick in growth continuing to the present day um, so there's the link there please do encourage your friends to join if they haven't already um, I think there was this very rapid growth at the beginning um, and then there was a period in the middle where the initial people had all joined and um, we were doing a lot of behind the scenes activities and I think the more recent growth has really been testament to the good work in sort of communications and online events and um, membership work that's been going on so that's fantastic next slide please 
So members, it's, it's a very low membership fee, as you know, we try to keep it low, so to have a very minimal barrier to entry for people. Um, and I think members primarily join because they're believers in what we are trying to do together and they want to support the society aims. They also have the opportunity to shape the direction through voting, standing as trustees, um, and opportunities to register early for the conference and perhaps other events we might run. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to say that we have finally solved this issue of um, direct debit being the only payment option for paying your membership fees. So that's removed a, a barrier that was preventing people without a UK bank account from joining. So it's great that card payments can now be accepted. And in the pipeline, there's a lot more um, work has gone on this year that has not quite yet been sort of launched and announced, but that will be on its way, uh, such as funding opportunities open to members. So we've agreed a budget and a process for sponsoring member run events and seminars. Um, and this hasn't yet launched because COVID put pay to in-person events around the time we were hoping to launch that. So watch this space. Um, and also, uh, Paul Richmond, as the incoming president, is going to talk a bit at the end of this um, trustee update section about other ways that members can take part in society initiatives and help to shape activities in the coming year. Next slide, please. As you know, so we're a charity and we're trying to further research software engineering for the benefit of research and the benefit ultimately of society. So we don't just exist to provide benefits to our members. Um, almost everything we do is open to the wider community to anyone who can benefit from it. And that wider community is, is where we started and it's always gonna be incredibly important to us. So our mailing list is open to anybody for free. You can sign up through the membership portal and it, that has 700 members now. There's still a bit of work to migrate some people from the previous mailing list. Our Slack community has over 2000 members and, and went up hugely by 851 over that reporting period since the society was founded. 140,000 messages to date apparently, so it's, it's just such an active and vibrant community. And for 4,470 Twitter followers, so it's not just all about paid membership, there's this massive wider community. And here again, I should sort of pay tribute to work that Claire Wyatt has done in um, making our communications much more active and uh, the newsletters and the, the tweeting and keeping, keeping everyone posted on Slack has really driven a lot of this growth, I think. Next slide, please. Right, this is actually the point where I hand over. So before I say goodbye, I would just like to say what a, what a sort of honour and a privilege it's been to be the president of the society and, and involved in the association before that. And, um, I, I will intend to remain very much involved and very much a supporter. Um, but I wish Paul all the best taking over as the new president and all the new trustees. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Alice. So this is um, the part where we go into some more detailed reports from each of the trustees on the areas for which they're responsible. Um, and we're starting off with the areas of web infrastructure and comms. So Anya and I are jointly responsible for web and infrastructure and Claire, who can't be here today, is responsible for the comms side. The main things we've been working on over the last year are, as you might expect, transitioning all of the systems and everything that goes on in the background from what the old UKRC association had to new infrastructure that belongs to the society and works in the way that we as the society need it to. So in addition to the tasks of maintaining existing services, uh, maintaining the website um, and helping to produce content for that, over the last year, um, to, I think it was at the very beginning of the year, um, we introduced the job board to the website. Since then, we've had over 100 jobs go up on the board um, with good numbers of views. I think we're a couple of thousand views total now on that, and that continues to grow. Um, 
there has actually been over the last couple of months an uptick in the number of jobs being posted for that so I expect to see quite a lot more growth there. On the side of transitioning things across the society and um, we've been moving things such as resource curation um, to the website so we now have a recommendation page where members can suggest resources that they think will be useful for the community and um, those will be reviewed and then hosted on the website for everyone to find because that's curated and um, we're hoping that that won't suffer from some of the link rot that um, this sort of resource set has suffered from in the past we'll have people who are looking over that every now and then to check that that's all up to date on the comm side, there was launch of the monthly newsletter a couple of months ago and since then every one of those has received around about three to four hundred views, um, which is quite good. So actually is being circulated more widely than just our membership itself. And that also there is the opportunity for members to suggest things that they think are important for the community to know about. Uh, particularly things like if you know of any upcoming events, um, events you're hosting or ones that you just think are important, then please let us know and they can be added to the newsletter. We've also relatively recently begun a migration of all of our documents and our email system um, to G Suite from Google, which puts us in much better compliance with GDPR, particularly with recent changes to Privacy Shield um, and the storing of data in America. Um, that's been quite important to me that we moved to that. It also allows us to do things such as have official society email addresses for communication, makes us look more professional and keeps everything together. Catalog cataloging of existing infrastructure, um, we've had inherited from the association before we began quite a lot of infrastructure resources that people knew about but you had to find the right person to contact about them so we've also been working on cataloging and formalizing our access to resources and the final thing which i think i've got more detail on the next slide is the switching off of the old association website rse.ac.uk um, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, so if you visited that website recently, you will have seen a big banner at the top telling you that the website's being turned off and please go to our new one at societyrse.org. The old website has been archived to GitHub, so if there are any resources or information on there that you do need access to that is not on the new website, um, and there are a few pages that have not been moved across, that is all archived to GitHub pages um, that everyone will have access to that is hosted. And I will make sure that a link to that is readily available before the old website is turned off. Switching off of that site is happening in the near future. Finally, if you are on the old society mailing list, um, which I think was everyone at rse.ac.uk on the, on the old association mailing list. Please do consider transitioning to the new society mailing list, which is managed through white views. You can find information on that um, on our membership page at societyrse.org slash join us. You can join that mailing list either by becoming a member or for free by just signing up for mailing list updates. And that is everything from me. Cool. Thanks, James. Okay, I think I'm, I'm up next on the activities and policy um, section. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? Great, thank you. So, um, even though there's been, um, obviously it's been a bit of a strange situation with everybody going online and uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, there's still been quite a lot going on in terms of uh, the events we've supported and things like that. And as you'd expect, most of the events we support, we've been supporting um, 
are all about community building and um, strengthening the community, and taking that taking that forward. So um, last year, obviously, there was the aspiring RFC leaders uh, workshop, trying to develop and support the next generation of the community leaders. And so we've got a sustainable pipeline of people uh, coming through and uh, taking the movement forward. Uh, the RFC leaders meetings, which have been face to face for a long time, but we've also had um, an online one as well since uh, since the pandemic. Um, have been really useful for people um, who are leading RFD groups, both in terms of sharing ideas and networking and getting some sort of informal support and mentoring. But more, I think in some sense, more importantly, supporting the growth of new RFD groups and uh, people who are starting up, as, you know, having somebody to talk to who's been through that, had that conversation, had that issue before, or, you know, has some advice to help you out. They've been really important um, for, as Alice, as Alice showed, the, the growth in the number of RFD groups. Um, as time's gone over, time's gone on over um, the lifetime of the society. And uh, we've also, um, well, I, I particularly run the uh, HPC RSE online meetings, um, which have been really useful for both connecting together the national HPC facilities with other RSEs um, who are also working uh, with people in HPC and just generally, again, sharing experience, growing the community, trying to help each other out. And, uh, you know, although we've talked a lot about, um, the community growing and how many people there are and the growth of RSE groups. There's still a lot of RSEs out there, I think, who are um, essentially, you know, working on their own or, you know, are, are slightly isolated from the rest of the community in terms of, at least physically at their institution. And these sort of meetings and, 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 and events bringing people together, gives them a chance to, to, to draw on the experience of the wider community and get that support um, for what they're doing. Um, there's also the RSE um, London and South East meeting, which if we go to the next slide, I've got um, a bit more to say about it in uh, some more detail. Um, so, um, as Alice said as well, uh, uh, so, you know, one of the things we've been working on is, in the past there's been a lot of sort of ad hoc support from the society for uh, various events, okay? Um, and we wanted to make that a bit more transparent and formal so that people could uh, apply for support and sponsorship from the society. A society funds to help them run an event that was aligned with the, um, the goals and the ethos of the society itself. And one of the ways, uh, so the first thing we need to do is uh, to pilot this and uh, the RSE London South East meeting is where we piloted sponsoring an event, uh, sponsoring events by the society and making sure that all those sort of sponsorship mechanisms work, that we could get everything uh, working on that sort of practical sense. Um, and as the trustees have also developed um, a term, uh, some sort of mechanism for allow people to um, put in uh, proposals for sponsorship so and for them to like, be reviewed and decided upon in a, in a, in a, in a transparent in a transparent way so you know so we can see that people um, funds where they're supporting uh, the society are actually being used in the right way to further the goals of the society that was due to launch earlier this year um, again it's been delayed a bit by um, by the pandemic and also because there's been a lot of other things going on influenced by the pandemic which i'll, I'll talk about in the next couple of slides with this with the um with the conferences around the world being being cancelled so can we move on to the next slide so in response to um the cancellation of various rse conferences around the world including the society's own one here in the uk um we got together with um the other international rse societies to launch this uh, SORSD, the online research software events, to try and um, make up a bit for that loss of um, community building that co comes on through the, through, the conference, through the conferences that we have and give an opportunity for people to take stuff that they've done and still showcase it and bring people together, even though um, there weren't the actual physical conferences going on. So we just skip to the next slide. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure most people here are, quite, are aware of what SORSD is, and there's been a lot of announcements about it on the Slack and um, events actually on, the, on, 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 on themselves. But it's a way you can submit sort of any sort of thing around RSE um, that you're interested in doing online. So, for example, talks, workshops, uh, demos, or stuff, poster sessions, lightning talks. I think actually it's just whatever you think is most useful and whatever you think um, could really work. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the RSE, so and, and that has been really successful. I mean, I was just looking at um, uh, the calendar events just before we came on here, and actually, one of the problems with it is there's too many interesting things and not enough time 
in my schedule to actually go and watch and, and join all these things. So I mean, really, if you do have an idea, I'd really encourage you to get involved with this. It, it, it's been really, very really successful. Um, and we're, I think one of the things for the uh, next incoming trustees is, is what do we do with this? Because it's been so successful, you know, how do you, it, there's obviously the potential here to do something, maybe there's the conference as well, but maybe something as well. So maybe we can chat about that in the questions and answer sessions or future ideas workshop that's coming up um, a, little, a, a little bit in the future. Okay, so um, skip on to my uh, final slide for my section. So as well as, and um, this section was events and um, activities and policy. So I've talked a bit about all the different events I've been involved and things that are going on right now. Um, the other thing is the society has a mandate to do is, is to really influence policy at um, funders levels, at government level, and to try and, you know, make sure that people recognize the role that RSE has been playing. I think this has been super important um, over the pandemic. I'm sure you've all seen the discussion of software, research software quality come out into the mainstream uh, national media and the spotlight that that's shining on how researchers and how software is used to deal with, with issues that really are life or death, okay? So um, having the society out there and being able to be a voice and respond properly to those things and engage with other bodies, such as BCS and things like that, who may who also have a stake uh, in this sort of stuff, has been really important. So, I mean, the fact that we have trustees um, sitting on the strategic committees at the research councils to lead to things like the, the RSE fellowship call that's open at the moment, um, gathering and reporting on the RSE impact on various bits of COVID-19 work um, and making sure that the RSE voices are heard in the RSE community is recognised as central importance to uh, research in the UK and strategic publications are all been incredibly important things that go on um, sort of behind the scenes, you know, I mean, usually you don't see these things, it's, it's been a bit different this year with things played out um, so publicly on Twitter and in, uh, and in, pub and in national um, mainstream publications but generally this work goes on behind the scenes. And the trustees and others, of course, uh, other leadership people from uh, within the RSE community are represented the society at a wide variety of event events, you know, and consistently making the case that of the importance of research software engineering and the openness and friendliness of the community and the way we work, we want to work together in an open collaborative way and to take this forward. Um, so I think that's the end of my section. So we're moving on to Simon. As treasurer next. Okay, hello. I'm, I'm being told I'm not allowed to turn video on for some reason. It needs to be allowed by somebody or other. I'm now co host. Should be allowed now. Okay. Not that I'm sure that will vastly improve my presentation, but there you go. Um, so, can I have the next slide, please? So I'm Simon Hetrick, I'm the, I've been the treasurer of the um, society and its pre predecessor for quite a long time. Um, the, one of the big reasons for us moving to become a charity was that we had flexibility over our own accounts and the way that we could use the money that we'd built up over previous years. Um, up until that point, um, all of the RSC community's money was held at the University of Southampton and it was sort of restricted by the the strictures of university finances. Setting up as a charity means that we can choose the kind of events we want to fund and the kind of work that we want to do. So that's a real benefit for the RSC community, but one of the problems that we found is that you know, there's, a, there's a, a significant amount of financial infrastructure that needs to be set up. There's been a lot of this talk already talk, uh, looking at the kind of necessary um, work that we've been doing behind the scenes, and I'm going to add to that, I'm afraid. So you know, we've had uh, bank accounts set up, various payment systems, uh, systems for claiming expenses, and we've retained accountants, which we'll see later on as necessary. This has been, this has required a lot of investment of resources that we would prefer, well time, that we'd prefer to be spending on, on running community events, but it's the absolute foundation to everything else that the society does. Um, one of the big problems with having the comp complex uh, finance infrastructure that we require is that there has to be a, a valid and easy handover and that's why we set up the idea of having a treasurer and a vice treasurer so I've been working with Matt over the last year on everything that, that we do in the finances so that he can pass on that um, that knowledge to his vice treasurer in the coming year and I wish him all the best for that. Um, 
so we have now have this flexibility of having our own finances and having control over them, but we are obligated to meet the charity requirements. Um, on the financial front, that's really just the preparation of um, an annual accounts, showing the, the money that we've taken in, how, how we've spent our money, and these need to be independently verified, which is the reason that we need to um, retain accountants. This process is being completed for this year, uh, and, and, it, and it all looks very positive. So um, that's kind of the overview of what's happened in this year. I'll qu quickly move to the actual numbers, so if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, so to start with the conclusion, uh, our balance currently sits at 104,000, approximately 104,000 pounds. That the majority of our money came from running the conferences uh, from 2016 to 2019. And as I said, this was all run through um, accounts of the University of Southampton. Um, they haven't actually ever been really sort of thanked for their role in, in supporting the RSE community since it started. So I would like to say thank you to the University of Southampton for being the sort of the quiet banker behind the community. The, um, the majority of the £100,000 that we've taken from those conferences were made over the, the last two um, conferences. The first conference wasn't as profitable, but, um, and then, so that, that was around about £100,000 in, £100, into our accounts this year. And we've, we've taken about £5,000 from memberships alone, and hopefully we'll see that increasing over the coming years. Now, the next section of the report would generally be on outgoings because that would be a fairly complex part of um, part of the accounts but lockdown affected that really quite significantly the majority of our money was to go on events on networking or on um, expenses for, for getting people to go to different places and we couldn't do any of that during lockdown that means that the outgoings for this financial year were only a thousand pounds and a half of that was used to support the RSC London and South East um, regional um, you know, get together of RSEs. So obviously this is not really what we want to do, but it's uh, not uh, far from normal times. Uh, and in the future, we're going to be looking at uh, spending our finances quite differently. Each year we have ring fenced 30,000 pounds, which will be used as the float for the conference so that we can ensure that we have a, an RSE conference every year, as it's already been discussed, we didn't have one this year. Um, the remaining bu budget will be allocated um, by the new trustees to various events and other activities that we're running. Um, that brings me quite nicely to uh, pass over to the next section, which is Paul talking about what we're doing in the following year. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, yeah, so we've, we've heard a lot there about um, what's happened with the society over the last year, and it's important that we now take a look forwards as, as to what's going to happen uh, and what plans we have. So uh, next slide, please. Before we do so, I think it's important we just kind of reflect on what the objectives of the society are. So the, this, is, this is the objective that we have um, uh, registered with the Charities Commission. So we, we uh, want to advance the practice of research software engineering for the public benefit in such ways as the charity trustees consider appro appropriate. Uh, so next slide. So that puts quite a lot of responsibility obviously on the trustees in determining what's appropriate. Uh, and, and really, I think what we'd like to do, um, particularly over the next year, now that we've formalised the, the, the trustee board and, and the trustee processes and governance, which has taken quite a lot of time and attention this year, is really do much more engaging with, with our own community, particularly with our members, uh, but then also reaching out to kind of non-members to, to kind of um, make sure that what the uh, society is doing kind of reflects what people want. Um, so there's a number of suggestions, a number of... Um, ideas that we have in the pipeline as i said some of those have stalled the events uh, process is stalled due to covid um, and it's important we kind of find new things to do uh, so one of the ideas that's come up um, previously is the idea of a mentoring program um, so that's obviously been discussed at the last conference we had a fantastic uh, panel session around mentoring and we've got lots of information that we've collated about how a mentoring program could be run uh, we have an informal program proposed uh, and we're, we're Kind of at the point that we could go ahead and, and, and move forwards with a trial for this. Uh, it also kind of, um, one of the things that we could consider doing is, is reaching out to kind of um, external companies who are used to delivering mentoring programs at a much greater scale. So rather than starting with a small trial, we could perhaps go straight into a large launch program um, uh, and run a program that's kind of uh, endorsed by kind of international standards for mentoring, which might be quite a nice thing to do. The key thing here is making sure that whatever program we put on is something that our members want. 
Um, and there was going to be an opportunity, which I'm going to kind of tell you about shortly, which is going to, going to give our members and give people a chance to kind of feed into that process and help us decide uh, how we move forwards with, with that program. So next slide, please. Uh, another area where we've made significant progress is uh, around um, engagement with commercial companies. So this is already happening uh, behind the scenes. And if you haven't noticed, then that's probably a good thing because it means we've, we've probably got the balance of doing that right. So um, what we don't want to do when we engage with commercial companies is subject our members uh, to be advertised on. So the, the, the key of, of having kind of success, successful engagement with, with commercial companies is that there's some kind of mutual benefit. So you may have seen events, for example, in our Slack that are sponsored by commercial companies, uh, and we've managed to make sure that those events have been um, things where RSEs have been actively involved in, in kind of building them. So things like uh, some of the cloud workshops that, that have been put on are good examples of that. And, and that's how we would like kind of commercial engagement to, to kind of continue. Obviously, commercial companies engaging with society have their own agenda for pushing their own products and services and so on, but they obviously need to do that in a responsible way and in a way that our members are kind of comfortable with is, is the first priority. So we have um, beginning, to, oh, so we'd, not even beginning, we do have a, a draft of what a commercial sponsorship and membership package uh, would look like. Uh, we've had some engagement recently from, from some of the sponsors from our conference who are keen on um, supporting the society. Uh, and one of the first things that we'd like to do, I think, once the new trustee board comes in, is kind of formalise and decide as to, as to what, what that should look like exactly when we launch it. Particularly with the, the conference kind of going away uh, this year and maybe some uncertainty around next year, we would need to kind of have a think about whether or not there's an opportunity to engage with, with commercial sponsors. So next slide. So one of the key ways that we see uh, we can get engagement from the community uh, is through working groups. So the reality is that, that you know, trustees have come in this year and, and perhaps slightly underestimated the amount of uh, process that we've had to go through to move from an association to a, to a formal kind of charity. A lot of that is done now, but it means that, you know, trustees have come in with a lot of good ideas, but we haven't necessarily had the time to put all of those in place. Part of that is because, you know, as a, as a bunch of trustees, 12 sounds like a lot, but it's, it's really not a huge amount of people. Um, and it's not a huge amount of time that people have necessarily set aside to be able to kind of really throw themselves into these. So really we want to kind of uh, use some of that, um, that keenness and, and excitement from the rest of the community to get people involved with some of these programs. So things like the, uh, the mentoring program, uh, things like um, uh, the, the commercial sponsorship and so on, the things that we, we want to help drive forward, not just as a, as a board of trustees, but bringing our members in uh, and, and having some conversation with them and helping them to kind of run some of our ideas. The conference is a key example of that, where we kind of reach out to the broader community and bring uh, people in uh, so that it's not just the trustees running it, that we've got a bit more capacity to kind of get things done. That's something we certainly want to do over the next year. Uh, next. So the big question really is, is conference, right? Will it, won't it happen? Uh, and, and the correct answer is at this point, we, we just don't know, right? So at some point we are uh, we're obviously aware that we need to make a big decision. And that point's probably approaching reasonably quickly towards the end of the year that we, we need to make a decision about booking venues. Uh, and the later we can leave that, obviously, the, the, hopefully the more information we'll have and, and be able to make a good decision about that. Obviously, there is a big decision to make um, because uh, committing to a conference you know, potentially commits quite a large amount of our uh, financial reserve should that not be able to go ahead of course it's impossible to now get insurance against COVID so uh, we may very well be uh, digging through some um, commercial contracts to, to see kind of what's in place before we sign up to particular venues that said uh, there is uh, some great work that's been done already uh, in identifying potential new venues I'm not going to allude to where they are but they, uh, they, they really do look fantastic and, and particularly Claire's done quite a bit of chasing around uh, potential new venues that look really exciting uh, and that we'd like to consider. So uh, expect some negotiation over the next few months uh, and hopefully we should be in a position to, to answer um, that, that question towards the end of the year. So next. So likewise uh, the society already engages with other organisations 
uh, particularly on the international uh, front. As I said, there's, a, there's an international leaders event coming up. One of the key uh, questions that, that I've kind of proposed to discuss at that is the relationship of the society with these other um, international organisations. So it's fantastic that we've now got associations that have sprung up uh, all across the world. Um, we don't necessarily brand the society as a UK only uh, thing. We do have international members, uh, but we, we certainly don't want to take away from other associations some of the momentum that they have kind of locally. So working out how to kind of formalise those international relationships is going to be kind of important for, for, for the next year. I think it's important that we look to having a, an international conference and it's not necessarily just for us to run that. We need to make sure we engage with the other associations and do that in a way that everyone's comfortable with. Um, likewise, there are other organisations that are becoming aware of the fantastic movement that is research software engineering. So particularly the British Computing Society have, have reached out to, to us and the SSI recently. So they've become aware of us um, because of media attention around uh, software. Uh, recently uh, and they've begun having a discussion with us about how they can support the RSE movement and perhaps even extend some of that scope beyond RSEs to research developers uh, and, and really kind of put some nice policy in place that's going to help promote that. Next. So of course we're going to have six new trustees coming in with six new fresh uh, sets of ideas which is fantastic. So all of that needs kind of considering as we move forwards um, the other thing is our membership benefits. Uh, so obviously, as a society, we want to support the whole community rather than just our members, but we would like to have a little look at that, that membership benefits uh, package and make sure that, you know, as becoming a member, that you get some value from it. Of course, people join because they believe in the cause, but we want to make sure that people, you know, feel uh, comfortable and obliged to kind of join and, and, and feel that they get something from that as well. Um, James has already mentioned that we'll be transitioning the old mailing list, but expect some kind of termination notices for that uh, to follow quite soon. Next. So with all of those things in mind, I'm, I'm really pleased to announce that the first event that we'll be uh, running with uh, the new trustees is the community feedback and planning session. So we've penciled this in for, well, in fact, no, I haven't penciled it in. It's, it's firmly in the calendar for the 27th of October, uh, 10.30 till 12. So this is an event that all society members uh, and non-members uh, are very welcome at. So I'm particularly keen to hear from non-members who are not members uh, to find out why they're not members and, and, and find out if there's things that the society could be doing or should be doing to help support those people. Likewise, we want to hear from members uh, about um, some of the ways that you know, they, they would like to get more involved with the society. So some of those things that I've mentioned previously about mentoring and so on are, are, are prime examples of, of some of the subject areas that we'd like to discuss. Registration for that event is open now, so please do register. Uh, we'll be having kind of a combination of some polling and some kind of breakout sessions for kind of open discussion. Really is a good opportunity to kind of have your voice heard uh, and make sure that society is, is kind of really representing you. The, the key, I think, uh, in terms of all of the things I've said is that we really do want your input. 